my first memory ever is this moment when I was probably four years old. I stood next to my gate daycare teacher and whispered in her ear, I have a ball of poop in my underwear. <laughs> she kneeled down and whispered back, that's okay, your mom should be here any minute. Not my problem, she may have well said. Apparently, I was also never potty trained. According to my mom, I just started changing my own diapers, and then one day I asked my parents, should I just use the toilet like you guys? <laughs> so when it came to poop in my youth, no one really gave a shit. Jump forward about 20 years, and I'm in my first serious adult relationship, which was a shit show through and through. However, it didn't start out that way. For anonymity's sake, we'll call this guy Gavin. Gavin and I met when he slept on my couch one weekend. He was visiting my roommate for spring break, and on the third day of his visit, we hit it off. We hooked up, then he kissed me goodbye. The following morning, he returned to Colorado to finish school. But despite the sudden separation, he couldn't stop thinking about me in our intimate night on my used futon. So we kept in touch, and a year later, after doing semi-long distance, he moved into my Sherman Oaks apartment with me and became my official boyfriend. When we became official, I sincerely thought I had found my soulmate. For those first few months, I could not wipe the smile off my face. I couldn't believe someone like him actually existed. He'd been Drew Paul's drag race with me for hours, and he wouldn't yawn or complain. We had the same taste in music and the same affinity for wasting the day away, smoking weed, and discussing the meaning of life. My friends all loved him, and our personalities just clicked. For the first time, I really felt seen in a romantic relationship, and I thought, this was perfect. This was it. But I remember also having this feeling in my gut, and it wasn't my bowels. It was a voice that whispered, this is just too good to be true. And it was. When Gavin moved to LA, we originally thought he'd stay with me for nothing more than a few weeks, maybe a few months, just until he found a job and a place of his own. But he ended up living in my bedroom with me in this tiny apartment that I already shared with three other roommates for an entire year. <laughs> Naturally, things became codependent very quickly. After a few months, we started fighting a lot, and I started to resent having someone always there making judgments on my every move. A lot of the things we fought about were things that I deemed very trivial. For example, early on in our relationship, we were cooking a meal together, and I wanted to make Alfredo sauce instead of red sauce. I get very impassioned about my homemade Alfredo. So of course, he teased me for being stubborn, and at the time, I agreed. I explained that my moon is in Taurus, and stubbornness is definitely part of my genetic makeup. But it was less playful when about a year later, Gavin accused me of being stubborn at a Sharky's on Ventura Boulevard. <laughs> if you don't know, Sharky's is a horrible Tex-Mex chain. And for some reason, Gavin and I found ourselves there with his friend from high school at 11 a.m. one morning. And breakfast is my favorite meal of the day. And I didn't feel like eating a burrito at 11 a.m., so I decided to go with the oatmeal. But this was upsetting to Gavin. After I ordered my food, he turned to me and asked, why wouldn't you want to try something the restaurant's known for? And I thought, at Sharky's? This isn't, <laughs> this isn't Gordon Ramsay's finest. Uh, so I tensed up. I got nervous. I explained that the oatmeal was the cheapest option, and it's what I was in the mood for. Why do you have to get so defensive, he asked. I'm not trying to be defensive, I responded. And that's how most of our fights would go. But it wasn't like these were just little tizzies. Maybe it started out that way, but our same capacity to talk about music for hours also manifested in a great ability to fight for hours and hours and hours. And as time went on, the things he was accusing me of became more and more severe. He blamed our problems on my low self-esteem. He said my aspirations were too fantastical. And during one of our worst fights, he claimed that I needed to show more passion in the bedroom. That he was fully capable of showing me passion despite my small boobs. So why couldn't I fake it? I was an actress after all, he reminded me. <sighs> I hated when we fought. Um, I've lost solid friendships because of how much I loathe confrontation. But growing up with my stepdad, I had a large threshold for anger. As a child in Florida, I saw my stepdad turn red as someone cut him off on Griffin Road. 
I watched as he followed this person, threatened them with a pocket knife, and caused a scene at a car dealership that he's subsequently banned from to this day. <laughs> Truth. When my siblings and I tried to make mac and cheese from scratch one afternoon, leaving a mess of crusty gouda all over the stovetop, I was the recipient of his anger for hours, sitting motionless as he screamed at me with so much venom the veins nearly popped out of his face. But my stepdad never tried to change. His apologies always felt insincere, and the anger always continued. Gavin, on the other hand, apologized profusely. He always admitted to his mistakes and tried to be better the next day. I felt that he had more consciousness, more motivation to change his ways. Plus, he had me. At our lowest moments, I always thought to myself, I'm the perfect patient match for his particular emotional challenges. With my patience and understanding, I could help him grow and we'd be all the stronger for it. When COVID arrived, I had all the time in the world to play the role of healer. At this point, he had his own apartment five minutes from my place. Even so, I was practically living with him, and since I was collecting unemployment, my full-time job became trying to make him happy. I started cleaning up after him, cooking for him, but my main job was trying to uplift him emotionally. He felt horrible about himself and life, and I thought if I tried hard enough, I could help him find happiness again, and I thought by doing that, I would also fix our relationship. So I made that my sole mission. Of course, this was a recipe for disaster. We were fighting so much that I lost about 20 pounds. I was breaking out with horrible rosacea acne all over my face. But the worst part was that I lived with a constant negative voice in my head. When we first hooked up on that futon, I thought I'd found myself. But as the years went on, I became like a stranger, a shell of the vibrant performer I used to be. The universe, however, was on my side. Like a miracle, a gift arrived in the form of an Instagram ad. While Gavin was mindlessly scrolling one afternoon, he came across an ad for a one-year music program in Spain to earn a master's in music production. So although I was terrified by the idea of him leaving, I helped him with the application. A few months later, he found out he was accepted, and a few months after that, I was helping him move all of his furniture into storage. Finally, we were forced to change things up. There was a break in sight. But with the pressure of him leaving, our fights also became way more dramatic. At that point, he was breaking up with me all the time and then saying he didn't mean it the next day. And when he wasn't arguing with me, he was feuding with my friends. And even when I went home, I was constantly on edge. If I hung out with my friends, I was somehow betraying Gavin. My inner child of divorce was losing her mind. I realized pleasing everyone was impossible, so I did the most melodramatic thing ever. I actually packed a suitcase and told my roommates I had to live with Gavin indefinitely until things got better between us. And I remember standing by the front door of my apartment with my suitcase like it was yesterday. I remember the confused looks on my best friend's faces and the nervous tension in my body. I wondered how I'd found myself in an episode of The Hills. Thankfully, things got a little better in the days leading up to Gavin leaving for Spain. He started saying things like, I hope you don't realize things once I'm gone. I know that I haven't treated you fairly, and I don't want you to have a change of heart when I leave. Throughout all of this, we always planned on staying together and doing long distance. And I cried so much in the months leading up to him leaving, but weirdly in the days leading up to it, I felt a strange stillness within me. On his last day in LA, we sat on the floor of his mostly empty apartment while he made me CDs on his laptop. We cried and held each other and talked about how we hoped the distance would be good for us. We knew we needed a change, but we were both terrified that it was now actually happening. And internally, I honestly wondered if this goodbye was going to be our last. Then it came time to take him to the airport. And I'm not sure if it was the nerves or the Dave's hot chicken, but all of a sudden, I had to poop. I went into his bathroom, and I wasn't expecting it, but I dropped the most massive shit of my life. I surprised myself at the sheer girth of it. And of course, there was no toilet paper, because we'd already packed everything up. My only option was paper towels, and this was the kind of shit that required a lot of cleanup. 
I needed more than one sheet. So naturally, the plumbing couldn't handle it, and I clogged the toilet. <laughs> on, any, <laughs> on any other day, there'd be a plunger right next to me. I'd be able to do damage control in five minutes, but the plunger was in storage too. So I watched as the shit water rose to the rim. I took a breath, <laughs> closed the lid, and walked away forever. <laughs> Not my problem, I thought. About a month later, while Gavin was in Spain, he asked me to log into his Google Drive to send him something at school. With his physical absence, I was getting used to a more peaceful rhythm. But when I logged into his computer and opened his files for the first time, I was met by another surprise. Right there, amongst his collection of music and homework, were about eight pictures of headless women with giant cartoon tits. When I brought it up to him over FaceTime, simply stating that it made me uncomfortable, he said, well, you watch porn. Why are you trying to make me feel bad? A few days later, he broke up with me over text message. And a few weeks after that, he was begging for me back. Only this time, I couldn't forgive him. I didn't take him back. And I haven't looked back since. And now, about a year and a half later, I truly feel more like myself than ever. I have my close friendships again. I feel purposeful, loved, and alive again. And because I had access to his computer for a year, I happen to know that Gavin is in Vermont. I also know that he did not get his security deposit back. <laughs> and you can blame a lot of things for that. The hole in his window, the hole in his closet door, or even my nail polish stain on his bathroom countertop but I'd like to think it was the clogged toilet and my massive shit that really sealed the deal. A shit worth $2,000. <laughs> Today, I think about three-year-old me, the toddler who changed her own diapers because she knew she had the ability to do so. And I definitely lost that girl along the way somewhere. And now I'm way more cynical about love, but I'm very grateful for this experience and the lessons it's taught me. From now on, when shit hits the fan, I'll promptly confront it, move on, and then write that experience into narrative form. Because life is full of shit that stinks, but at least I know now, with profound clarity, that I've always been strong and independent enough to wipe my own ass. Give it up for Heather Cunningham!